So welcome everyone and thank you for coming to today's talk. Today, as a member of the EMEA Mental Health Conference Committee and one of your well-being champs, I'm delighted to be able to welcome Florence Savant schreiber to Google France. Uh, Florence, having studied humanistic psychology and sustainability management in San Francisco, she went on to train in positive psychology with the renowned Harvard professor Tal Ben Shahar. She is the best-selling author of Trois Kif Par Jour and Power Patate, and she joined us today to discuss Unleash Your Superpowers. Please put your hands together for Florence. Thank you very much. You, you, may, want, you may want this. So, bonjour, hello. My name is, um, is Florence, uh, Florence Servant Schreiber. I picked to do this uh, talk in English because I believe most of you do speak English. And most talks I do are in French, so I decided to do something a little more difficult than I usually do since we are going to be unleashing our superpowers. So why would we talk about superpowers, possibly? How many of you here are familiar with positive psychology? OK. So for the rest of us, um, positive psychology is not positive thinking, just so you relax on that matter. The, um, what, what is positive psychology? Basically, about 20 years ago, a researcher from University of Pennsylvania, Marty Seligman, realized that when we dealt with research in psychology, it always had to do with um, mental health, of course, but with mental diseases. And basically, he was elected at the head of the um, Psychology Institute of the United States, which basically brings together researchers. And Seligman said, why don't we try and see if we could think research differently to come up with a preventive psychology? Because we all know that in health matters, there are things that we can do more of or less of that will enable us to live longer and better health. But on a mental level, are there things that we can do more of or less of that will enable us? So what can it enable us to do? Not so much avoid the hardships of life, because the hardships will be coming our way. Maybe it's already, they have already come your way. But the good news is they are heading towards us. So since they are heading towards us, to know how to get back on our feet in order to feel more power to be able to get back in our daily lives after miserable things happen to us. That's when he decides to create a new area of research. Positive psychology is actually brings together researchers from different psychology labs who work on three things, behaviors, personalities, and organizations that work. It's also called the science of happiness. Have you heard of the science of happiness? OK, wonderful. So this is what positive psychology is. So my job, my day job, I have a few, a few jobs, but my day job is to actually be a um, happiness teacher. So what I do is uh, look at the research, try everything before I get anywhere to talk or write about it. And thanks for the author thing. Um, I, I have published books, so maybe I am the first author that you are seeing here. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> anyway, before I write anything, before I talk about anything, I actually try it out. And I guess that's how I'm able to come in and tell you what we can possibly do. Positive psychology is information. It's not therapy. Once you know that there are certain behaviors that can lead us to feel this way or that, then you are completely free to try it out. So since this is all about happiness, let's start with happiness. What is happiness? Basically, maybe I'll begin with what it is not. Happiness is not the opposite of unhappiness. If you look at your lives, whatever day goes by, whatever month or year goes by, you will be swinging from one state to the next. Sometimes you feel great. Sometimes you feel awful. And maybe the, the day so far has gone perfectly well. None of us here is protected from receiving a terrible text message where your world goes upside down. None of us. But on the other hand, we can wake up feeling really grumpy, and none of us is protected from a coup de foudre. You know what coup de foudre is? Love at first sight. Okay? We have no idea what's going to happen. The only thing that we have to understand is that we will be swinging from one state to the other. And 
The opposite of happiness is apathy. Apathy is when we are stuck in the middle and we just don't know where to go. And the clinical version of apathy is called depression. And that, in that particular matter, we need regular psychology to cure us. But when we're dealing with flourishing, when we're dealing with how do we enjoy the projects that we work on, how do we enjoy the relationships that we are in, how do we dilate inside of our little envelope here, this is a pretty small space that we each use on this planet. Within that little space, how can we use up most of the space that is ours, actually? And that is what positive psychology is about. Let's expand inside who we are. So I have a question for you. Where does our ability to be happy come from? I'll be a little more specific. Who among you believes that our ability to be happy is genetic, that it is pre-programmed? Who thinks it is? OK. Who thinks it's not? All right. And who doesn't know? OK. So this is one of the first things that regular psychology, one of the first questions that they ask, where does our ability to be happy come from? Is it genetic? So the first thing they have to do is scratch their head. How can we find that out? And they realize there's only one way to go. They are going to have to find identical twins. And identical, identical twins are basically one egg that has been separated in two pieces. So it's the same genetic code. But we need these twins to have been separated at birth, adopted in different families. And we prefer them to be older than 40 years old, so things have happened to them. And these twins come in. And um, the question is now to measure their happiness level. So how does one measure a happiness level? Basically, there's no software. There's no um, blood test, no saliva test that can tell us if you're happy. The only way to measure happiness is self-declarative, knowing that you are the only person to know how you feel. So we ask you a series of questions. And you always have to answer on a scale from 1 to 10. So for example, you can be asked, how do you feel about your current projects? Or you can be asked, how do you feel when you look at your peers? Or how do you feel about your childhood dreams? We can also go through emotions. How much joy do you feel right now? How much anger? How much fear? And so forth. We sum it all up and we have an average. That's your happiness score. So the um, twins have very different lifestyles. They are asked all these questions. However, they come up, 90% of them declare the exact same level of happiness as their twin. So the researchers are very happy. And they publish. And they say, OK, ladies and gentlemen, happiness is just like height. It's genetic. The talk is over. <laughs> OK, this is before positive psychology comes in. So we live with that for a while. And then these new scientists come in with a, very, with a, a slightly different approach when it comes to happiness. Basically, what they have figured out is the following. The question conditions the response, which means that if, and if our lives, we look for what's wrong, we will find what's wrong right away. But if we start looking for what is right, then we will start looking what is right and what is going well in our lives. So what they see are the same results, but they read them upside down. And what they are interested in are the 10% of twins who have the exact same genetic code as somebody else. However, they are happier or unhappier. How is it possible? So a woman named Sonia Lubomirsky uh, works out of UC Davis in California. And in her lab, the only question she asks is, where does happiness come from? She has met people who have experienced all our wildest dreams, winning at the lottery, getting an entire makeover physically, you know, that type of crazy things that we always think that could possibly make us happier. Anyway, she went through a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of situations and people. And basically, she was able to figure it out. 50% of our ability to experience happiness is actually predetermined. It comes from one of our genes. 
um, called the 5-HTT. 5-HTT swims up there somewhere and is responsible for manufacturing all the neurotransmitters that run up in our brains. Dopamine, endorphins, serotonin, oxytocin, you know all these words? Okay, lots of N words that are basically all the substances that our brain will actually manufacture when we feel great. And when we feel great, it manufactures even more. So the longer the 5-HTT, the more of these neurotransmitters our brain is able to manufacture. The shorter it is, the drier it is up there. So this is why there are different uh, types of personalities. And we all have people around us for whom everything is fun, everything is cool. Basically, it's probable that they have a very long 5-HTT. And then for the rest of us, maybe it's a bit shorter, and we don't really experience things the same way. But you know something? It's exactly like height. It is a lottery. But for example, I belong to, um, let's say, I, I'm a short person. OK, well, I can tell the tall people that even at this altitude, life is fine. You know, we are fine. We will get used to whatever our conditions are. And that's the good thing about humans. We're great chameleons. So that's half of it, of our ability to be happy. Now, what else do we need to be happy? So I'll just take orders. What would you like? We all want the same thing, OK? So you can just shout it out. Yes. Love. Thank you. What else? Excuse me? Connections, Connections yes. Purpose, yeah. What else? Food. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, food. Certainly. Health, yes, to be in good health, of course. Comfort. Little money, anybody? Nah, really not. Sunshine? You know, just the regular stuff. I mean, there's a lot of regular stuff that actually makes us happy. So if we talk about regular stuff, such as sunshine, comfort, for example, even health, uh, the weather. I mean, everybody religiously looks at the weather. It's usually 53% accurate, not much more. However, we still look at the weather as an anticipation to our happiness. All those things are circumstances. And the outside circumstances, even, even our health, is a circumstance, actually. The circumstances count for 10% of our happiness. But the thing is, we each, we all have a list. It's not even one arm long. It's two arms long of things that we would like to change or meet or eradicate if it was legal. You know, things where we think, yes, if I could change my life, if things were different, then I would be happier. Maybe 10% happier. But then, of course, we do sometimes need to act on our circumstances, and we can. But what we cannot expect is that changing the circumstances will change everything that happens. So 50% is pre-programmed. 10% comes from the outside. How much is left? 40%. Yes, you people can count. Great. So what do these last 40% rely on? They rely on how we, in our interpretation of what happens in our lives. And it has been determined that the happiest people, when something does not go the way they had planned it, what they will do is that rather than um, considering it as a setback, they will actually feel that they're already moving forward in a different direction. Meaning, when something happens to us that upsets us, that we did not plan, we do not want, we will be frustrated. We will be angry. We will be pissed off. We may even cry. It's called being human. But pretty quickly, these people will say, OK, I had planned to go this way. I'm actually going to have to go this way. And they get back on their feet, and they start moving again. And basically, what we have to remember is that it is not so much what happens to us, but it is what we do about what happens to us that really matters. So I know a little bit about that. About that. Um, I became interested in positive psychology and, uh, and changed to this new profession because my previous job left me. So in such a circumstance, 
but at least some of you think it's funny. I didn't think it was very funny when it when it when it happened exactly. It's always you know it's always a little uh, lots of things downsizing and you know say no everything's fine, but it is a little humiliating. I mean there's a lot of stuff that happens at that particular time. But had it not happened. I really don't know why or how I would have gone back to study, had the time to simply gone back and study positive psychology for real, which is what I did. And I learned all this material, and I thought it was so easy to implement and so interesting and so ongoing, because the research is constantly ongoing. It's a very new science that I decided, so in France, things are sort of well organized when you get fired. You know about that. And I had a little time on my hands, right? So what I decided to do was try everything. So I tried everything. I learned meditation. You guys know about meditation, right? OK, you know that meditation can be learned. You don't just sit there and meditate. It's actually a skill. It's like the rest of the things that we, that we know how to do. Uh, I exercised more. To be honest, I began exercising. And, and I did write letters to people in my life, because when you do write letters to people, you are, you are happier. And then at the end of this um, particular year, I have a tendency to forget things. I didn't want to forget this time. So I decided to sit down and write the story. And when the book came out here in France, um, I, and the, the book did very well instantly, so that was a surprise. But I realized something very simple, that although we are very unique individuals, there's something we have all in common. With more information, we make better decisions. And the more we know about behaviors, the freer we are to choose to implement these behaviors or to try things out. And that's how I decided to go on and keep talking about this particular, um, particular topic. Then, um, as we say in, in, in French, the, basically, je me suis pris un autobus dans la figure. Basically, uh, a bus ran me over. Not literally, but we will all be run over by buses. And in my case, um, what happened is that I had a very, um, very close and dear cousin. His name was uh, David Servantschreiber. Some of you may know his, uh, his name. And um, David was my age, and David died. He died from brain tumor. He was a doctor. And he, uh, as a doctor, when he was diagnosed, he, di he was diagnosed when he was 30 years old. And he decided to look for ways that he could fight cancer. His doctor said, just go on and live the way you live your life. And he said, no, I don't believe that. And I'm sure there's something better that I can do. So he began researching all the, compulsing all the research that has been done about fighting cancer cells that weren't really um, promoted. And basically completely changed his lifestyle and gained 20 years of life expectancy. Brain tumors usually win the fight. And it did. David was a psychiatrist. And he had um, built a training school for psychiatrists. And that company was orphaned. And one thing that I decided to do uh, one morning is I woke up and, um, and I thought, OK, I'm going to buy this company from his kids. And I'm going to continue his work. And that's when all my little voices woke up. So one little voice here told me, you know, Flo, let me just remind you, you can't count, which is not untrue. And then another voice here said, you, you did already start a company, remember? And, um, and the company went broke. Are you sure you want to do that again? And I said, OK, girls, thank you very much for the advice. But I'm going. I'm going to do this. And this was seven years ago. I have no other word to define what has happened to us professionally than to say that we have flourished. You know what flourished is? Fleurir. So how do you flourish on a professional level? What does it mean? So it means, of course, that all the jobs were saved and we have created more. We've expanded. It means that we've gone beyond our objectives. It means that we like the way we contribute to the area that is ours. And it also means that we were able to learn to work together. Because there were people that had, I had not chosen, and they had not chosen me either. However, it did work out. So I began wondering, how is it possible how can somebody very normal like me, so I know, I know two things. I was trained in English, obviously, and in psychology. But running a company, managing a team, not only did I have no appetite, but you know, no intuition for that at all. But it worked. So that's when I began looking at superpowers, obviously. And, um, and I was started to wonder if there weren't 
within each one of us very simple things that we could actually count on when the storm started you know, coming up and coming at us. So naturally, what did I do? I turned to positive psychology. And what these bunch of researchers did when they actually began um, positive psychology is they realized that there was no universal list of human qualities. We did not know what qualities were to be found across the world and that we could actually count on. So they began looking, and they read everything that was published in psychology, philosophy, religions, and put them all together. And they came up with 24 common character strengths, they called them. Character strengths are qualities, basically. And um, so they had to make sure, they had to verify that these qualities actually really existed when you went out to meet people. So they separated in different teams. And one of the team, my favorite team, went to Africa. And they go to and visit Maasai warriors. Now, Maasai warriors are people who still hunt lions with um, pierces. Pierces, is that how you say it? Spears, spears, with a spear. And so they go to the Maasai warrior, and um, they say, OK, this is for like a, a study that we are handling. Um, do, are you familiar with the concept of leadership? So the Maasai warrior says, uh, yes, I am. So no, no, no. Do you personally know people who actually um, are leaders? So the Maasai warrior says, yes, I do. No, no, no. Do you know as many men as women who actually express leadership? So the warrior says, yes, I do. He says, no, no, but one more question. Would you like your children to actually express leadership. And he said, of course I want my children to express leadership. So they're like, yeah, they know about leadership. You know, it's very, it's a familiar trait. And they did the same thing with Eskimos, Eskimo um, uh, pêcheurs, pêcheurs. Fishermen, thank you very much, uh, with, with Eskimos and so forth. And they validated these qualities. So let's see what qualities we have in this room, may as well. Who among you? is funny. <laughs> OK. All right, that's not bad. You know, when you, when you walk in a class of uh, elementary school children and you say, OK, who is smart? Everybody raises their hands, all right? So I'll ask it again. Who among you is funny? All right, OK, there you go. Who, who among you has the, a sense of justice? Yes, very nice. Who among you is uh, perseverant? Yeah, OK, wonderful. Little harder. Who among you is honest? <laughs> OK, most of you are more honest than you think. OK, let me just check. Uh, who's ever kissed anyone? OK, this is a happiness class. You know, there are things that are worth living for, you know? <laughs> things that you could, you could actually try. So these are, very, um, these are very common qualities. And what is a superpower? It's a very common quality, except that it's yours. So basically, how do you use it? So the culture that I come from, being French, you have to know, if you're not from this country, that talking about your qualities just never happens. It's not something we do. It's rude. It's pretentious. It's absolutely not something we ever do. So when we do come up with a list like that, it's very useful because all of a sudden there's something a little objective, you know, because actually what you do is you go online and you answer a bunch of questions, and at the end of the questionnaire, you are given the answers that tell you, okay, among the 24 universal character strengths, these are how yours are organized, and then you know how it works. Why is it useful? I'll give you an example. When I decided to um, write this book, I had no idea how you write a book. So I actually went and asked people, senior people who had written books. They all came up with, their, um, with the different ways that they do it. But one thing came, up, came back systematically. All of them told me, you sit down at 8 AM, and you do not get up until 12. So I sat down at 8 AM. And I had the title of the book, Trois Kifs Par Jour, that I knew. Ksh. 
9 o'clock. I'm sitting down. 10 o'clock. Eleven o'clock. Balance it out. Eleven thirty, twelve o'clock. And by twelve o'clock, I feel like a pile of dust under my desk. And I say to myself, How do you expect to write a book considering you can't even stay on your chair, basically? And I did tell you earlier I think that I forget everything. One thing that I had forgotten when I actually uh, studied positive psychology, of course I answered this questionnaire. It's one of the basis, basic things that you do. And there is a quality that a lot of you here have, and you have to know that I'm very um, impressed by how many of you have this quality, which is called perseverance. Perseverance is the ability to start something and take it all the way until it's done. When I answer, the questionnaire, out of the 24 strengths, my 24th strength is perseverance, which means that in this life, I will never experience perseverance. And it absolutely does not matter. And what we have to understand is that if we want to do, if we do want to take on challenges to have interesting relationships with people, to, are, to be excited about the projects that we're actually running and enjoy doing what we're doing, we have to honor the strengths that come to us naturally. So in my case, I'll give you my first, my first top five. The number one is curiosity. Number two is creativity. Number three is the ability to love and be loved, meaning that people matter a lot to me. Number four, I did not even know it was a strength. It's called recognition of beauty. It means that I'm very sensitive to beauty around me, but also to a job well done. And then number four is, uh, is called zest, joie de vivre. How do you write a book with these things? Basically, the way it works is that I do sit down at 8 o'clock, just like the perseverance. My brain is fresher, yes. But I do exactly what I can. And when I can't take it anymore, I do get up and I go in the room next door. And it so happens to be the kitchen. And with my fingers, my creative fingers, who cannot just do intellectual stuff, I will either cook something or make myself a cup of tea. It doesn't matter. I need to use my fingers differently. I come back. I sit down. And when I get stuck again, I'll probably grab a pen and start drawing a, a star or whatever, because I'm thinking already about the cover of the book. And it's as, it matters to me as much as what's inside the book. And then I get back to work. And I live in Paris. When I get stuck again, I even live in this neighborhood. You may see me walking around. When I get stuck again, what I do is I go outside. And I need to see, I need to count buses and pain au chocolat and whatever there is because my curiosity needs to be fed every day. And on the way back, I will probably call somebody and have a conversation with a person, with a live person. And once I understood that and honored that, not only was I able to hand my book in with uh, 24 hours ahead of time, but most importantly, I began enjoying what I was doing. And what we each and every one of us has to remember is that we are completely unique. We are a complete, unique, completely unique composition of these qualities. Statistically, it's impossible to have somebody in this room who has the same design of qualities than you have. And probably, if you are stuck in anything in your life, whether it's a project that's difficult or communicating with your kids, communicating with your lover, whatever it is, you are probably not using your top qualities. And you are probably using the ones that are in the middle, or maybe the worst part is in the bottom. The French school system is very perseverant. I was a very miserable student in school. But now that I can design my own line of work and the way I do it and however I want to do it, of course, there's no, practically no limit to where you can go once you start respecting that. So when I was looking for superpowers, I also began wondering if there weren't things that were a little more common to everybody, not as singular as the character strengths. And I ran into something very interesting called the others, other people. I don't know if you've heard the fact that we are social creatures, meaning that we are very interdependent. So if people look at you with admiration, 
you, would fe you will feel admirable. You say that? If people look at you with criticism, you're actually going to feel terrible about yourself. That's how it works. We are that sensitive to other people. And there's one great study, you probably heard about this study already, where researchers come into classrooms where children are between eight and nine years old. And they tell the teacher, we came up with a questionnaire to determine if you have high potential students in your class. Okay, so the kids answer the questionnaires. They have no idea what they're gonna, what, why they are answering these questions. So they answer them, they answer everything. Then the researchers gather all the, all the tests and they thank everybody and they leave. They get to their lab and they throw everything out. They come back three weeks later and say, we have looked through every single test, which is completely untrue. Uh, we have looked through the tests and we have found some high potential students in your class. Would you like to know who they are? Of course, the teacher says yes. They don't even go and see the kids. They ask for a list and randomly, completely randomly, they point to three kids. She's one, she's one, he's one. Those kids that particular year made tremendous progress compared to their other classmates and later on went for longer studies. Why? Because for one year, somebody looked at them thinking, you are a high potential person. And I can hear you. So the first thing that comes to your mind is, OK, people should have looked at me differently, right? <laughs> that explains it all. OK, then in, in the, if any, by any chance you have children of your own, you are completely panicked. It, it, it is still time. And, but the question that I would rather ask you is how do you look at people? Because I know how the French people look at other French people. But how do you look at people? Do you look at people wondering, woof, look at this guy. Or do you wonder what are this person's qualities? What are their superpowers? How do I work with these superpowers? Because in an ideal world, parents would look at their children like this. Managers would look at their employees like this. Teachers would look at their students like this. But then there's real life. I can testify. When um, my oldest son, Arthur, was 21, he came to me and he said, um, OK, mom, I'm going to Australia. So I'm trained in positive psychology, you know, the whole deal. <laughs> and what comes out of my mouth is don't even think about it. That's real life. So what we need to do about this information, just remember that here, what matters are the 40% that we actually have control over. I have no control over what you're right now thinking about me. None. And I never will. That I cannot control. I have no influence on. But this is what I have control on. I can decide whom I talk to and about what, meaning, when Arthur comes to me, because his plan is to go to Australia, and I'm unable to encourage him, then his mission is to go to somebody else who sees him bigger than he is. We all have in our lives people that we actually turn to when we want to do something difficult, and we say, OK, this is what I want to do. And then some people will say, yeah, um, you know, I don't know. I just wouldn't want you to be disappointed type of th reaction. OK, you, you don't go back to these people. And then there are other, there's another type of person where you actually say, I do want to go to Australia, who say, yes, absolutely, you have to go to Australia. We must know in our lives who sees us bigger than we are. We can organize our support system. We can organize the mirror that is actually held in front of us, because this is how we'll push forward. So let me finish with the 10 happiness tips if you want. Scientifically proven, OK? All of them. Number one, savor more. Savourer. You know what savoring is? We spend so much time being already in the whatever's coming next, or still in what came before, that most of the time we just forget to be here, doing what we're doing right now. So one way to savor is very easy when we're actually somewhere and happy about where we are. We turn to the person next to us, and we just say, this is great. That's savoring. Number two, stop 
comparing yourselves to others. Not only are you fine the way you are, but it is the way you are that we need you to be. Because that is when you are the most singular, the most attractive, the most competent, the most unique. There is absolutely nobody else out there like you. And your only job is to live with this particular person. So that's all you have to do. And when I say stop comparing yourselves to others, we usually compare ourselves socially. So when it comes to happiness, this is the next step, tip. Think less about money. All the economists have looked at the situation. What is the link between wealth and happiness? So, of course, if you are destitute, if you are a refugee, for example, it, what, it will make a lot of difference, necessarily. But in this particular room right here, it probably will not make a difference. Accumulating goods has never made anybody happy. There is one exception, shoes. <laughs> Next tip. Scientifically proven, the shoes. And we're waiting for the handbag research. It's on its way. Um, next tip. There are three components to happiness. One is pleasure. Number two is engagement. And number three is meaning. Which means that we need all three. Pleasure is not enough. Pleasure is great. Engagement means we need to be part of, part of groups, part of projects, there's something very active about being happy. It's not just watching nature. Watching nature is part of happiness, but there's something very productive. But it's not enough. We also need to have meaning. Why am I doing all this? What does it bring to me? What am I bringing to the world? That's very important. So there too, if you think your life these days is not exactly how you want it to be, do you have enough pleasure? Sometimes we're changing the world and we're super busy. But is it pleasant enough for us? And then sometimes we're partying like wild, you know, wild people, and we're completely engaged. But is there any meaning to us? So it's a way of adding what you need or just making sure everything is there. Following um, tip has been proven by Maria Montessori. You know, she works with children. She worked with children. We're big children. We're never as happy as when we have decided what we're doing. So the best thing to do is to take initiatives and say, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to work on. This is what I want to watch. This is what I want to eat. The more we express our needs and desires, the easier it is to get there. Number six, cherish your families, cherish your friends, cherish your colleagues. Why do I say this? Because uh, the longest happiness study began in 1938. It was decided to follow the entire class of Harvard University, all men at the time. And they all agreed to answer a questionnaire every year about their life conditions and their happiness levels. After 30 years, the researcher um, retires. So the younger researchers come in and say, so now, come on, you've been looking at these people for 30 years now. Can you tell us anything about happiness? Like, have you noticed any difference between the ones that are happy and the ones that aren't? And he said, yeah, absolutely. You know, I know everything about these guys. I know where they live. I know how much they make. I know if they're alcoholic, if they're depressed. I know uh, if their mother was nice to them when they were kids. And the only thing that matters is love. And when he says love, it's not just romantic or family ties but it is the nature of relationships that we actually have in our lives. Following tip, um, trois kif, three good things. Count your blessings. A blessing is something that you have the urge to say thank you for. It usually it's called gratitude. It usually starts with pleasure, but pleasures just fly out the door, unless we stop just for a second and think to ourselves, for that, thank you. When we do that, we can gain up to seven years of life expectancy. 
there is a physiological response to gratitude that will make us live longer and in better health. The following tip, exercise more, I told you. And I'm just talking about mood exercise. I'm not talking about physical health, just the brain health. We were not um, designed to order sushi and ride escalators. That was just not the plan. So our bodies are completely underused. We need to use the body in order to irrigate the brain. So it's three times 30 minutes of aerobic anything that you want to do. When you live in Paris, usually you walk around, so it's good. You're, 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 you're there already. Um, next before last, when you talk about happiness, giving is always superior to receiving, which means that every time we do something for somebody else, we get a little shower of dopamine up in the brain. That makes us feel absolutely wonderful. And then the last tip, this one is physiological. Okay, This one will work with anybody, whomever you are. When you need to feel better, right in a moment, in an instant, there's only one thing to do, smile. And when I say smile, it's not smile, you know, but when all the muscles in the face are engaged, it's impossible to experience dark thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Florence. That was a very, very insightful, very entertaining talk. Thank you. Um, I know you've got a short window yes. just for some Q&A. So can I open it up to, uh, to the audience? Are there any, are there any questions following this talk? Are there any questions for Florence? So questions can be your own stories. You know, when it comes to happiness, whatever, positive psychology is just about observing regular people. So why is it useful? Because we're so busy with our lives that we only do the things we do them. And sometimes just hearing how other people actually do things gives us more ideas. So your, your um, how can I say, your experience has as much value as anything that I have said so far. What is this yellow box? It is a microphone. Oh, it's a microphone. <laughs> yeah. It can be thrown. So there's a running, there. oh, it can be thrown, okay. Hi, I just have a question. Don't you think that happiness is linked to expectations? The less you expect and the more happy you are. Uh, yeah, well, sometimes it's also fun to expect things that actually happen. <laughs> you know, there, there's that too. Um, how can we put it this way? Maybe expectations are um, a frein or hind can hinder happiness. Yes, there is a link. But it's also great to have expectations. For example, when people actually buy tickets to the lottery, so the worst thing that can happen to you is win the lottery because then you're in huge trouble. You know, mentally, it is a big challenge to actually win a lottery. But buying the ticket is the instant of expectations. And the reason so many people buy these tickets knowing that they will never win anything is just for the thrill of imagining what you would do if you actually did win all that money. So anticipation rather than expectations is a great feeling. And what, that's another tip I can give you is to, but you know that already, is to have things in your life that you actually anticipate that are coming, that are not there yet. You know, sometimes we say here, in, at least in France, that the best part about love is walking up the stairs, right? That's anticipation. We have another question just over there. Thank so you. where does culture come in all this? Uh, so culture is very present, uh, but the brain structure remains this, the same. I mean, you are probably all very multicultured here, and whoever has been raised in France and travels to the United States, for example, realizes it's a very different culture. Because, for example, when it comes to happiness, and I, I don't want to generalize because it, each individual is, of course, very unique. But it's true that when you do get to sunny California, which has been my case many times, people are, by default, positive about what can happen, about a possibility. Whereas when you come back to Paris, by default, we are against whatever is happening. That's the basis. Because if we are against, then it's much uh, chicer, you know? 
It's beaucoup plus stylé d'être contre. It is, because we believe that because we come from such an intellectual background, yes, we believe that if we mark our opposition, it shows that we have uh, thought about it, you know, that we're smarter. So culture is huge. But inside, the mechanisms are the same ones. So we have access. Even us in Paris, we do have access to happiness. It's possible. Uh, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? Try. OK. So yesterday was uh, International Day of Girls. Yes. And I would be very curious to know what kind of girls you were but and what was your approach with happiness. Uh, as a child? Yes. OK. Um, even as a grown up, I'm a um, very worried, pessimistic individual, which is the reason that I found so much value in what I'm bringing you today. I am not like that. I mean, yes, you, I mean, I am completely like that. But it comes, it comes from fear. It comes from um, just, it come, yeah, I guess fear is, is probably the, 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 best, um, the best word to qualify it. Because I am an anxious person, I need to do things that make life easier for myself, if that answers your question. But I did have fun too, you know. But yes, it, do, it does come from, you know, the thing about positive psychology, and you know that, you all know that, when life is all right, we need none of this. We need none of this information. We just go on as, you know, as leading our lives. That's what we do. But when all of a sudden things get a little darker and things get a little more complicated, then it's very useful to know that we have these resources. I'll give you an example. When it comes to gratitude, my favorite absolute topic is gratitude. When the researchers decided to look at what the impact of gratitude can be, one thing they did, they actually found out. They decided to go and five years after 9-11, go meet with the families, with the victims' families. They wanted to understand what people had done in order to get back into life. How did they get back into life? And they found different families. Some were not back into life. Some were already back into life. And one of the differences between the two is that the ones who were back in motion were people who before 9-11 in their everyday life were expressing gratitude and feeling gratitude. So this is why when we talk about preventive psychology, the more in our everyday OK lives we can practice to use gratitude, for example, and to feel grateful, when the storm hits the fan, we will have more training. It will be easier for us to actually press on the button. So this is what is so precious about all this information. Once again, it's just to train. You know, our brains, um, the default mode of our brain is to first perceive negativity. Whatever is wrong, smells awful, is scary, has much more impact on us than what is nice and good because we consider it's regular. It's a safety measure. It's very useful for danger. But however, When, for the day we really get in trouble, it is definitely worth, while things are okay, to start training with all these little exercises. And optimism is one that I really work on. I work on it. It's, a, it's really, it's like an exercise that I do. It's like a physical exercise that I do on my brain. Or else I just think everything, the, the world is over. And every time one of my kids had a fever, I thought he was going to die. So this is why, you know, this is why we need to train. We, can, we all know what our levels are. We know what our buttons are. We know what our fears are. And we can help those fears. That's the good news. Two more people. Do you ever throw it, actually? I will. You Have can. people thrown it? Up. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> okay. It's throwing it. Yeah. Yes. Um, I like it very much when you share the story of your son coming to you, saying he was going to Australia, and you kind of, let's say, not, you were not really supportive. Uh, but what happens when you actually try to be supportive, but just think that someone has a very bad idea. How do you manage that? Ah. Can I just say, go to someone who is going to be supportive because you really, truly, sincerely think that it's not a good thing for them? Um, well, of course. Okay, that's called a, a debate. <laughs> And you can, you can get into a conversation. In that case, it was a good idea, so I had nothing more to say. But of course, you debate your ideas, uh, necessarily. And people do have terrible ideas. And when you're a mother, wait till you see what ideas your kids have. Uh, They have terrible ideas. I can see yeah. already. 
Um, I just wanted to ask you a question. So if, if you do some readings or if you go to such talks and you feel really inspired, but you have someone that you really love and you see that they're stuck and they're in an unhappy place, um, what can you do to help them without coaching them or sounding like you're giving them instructions? Okay. I would be really interested. That's a real life situation. Mm. Um, we cannot change other people. That's the first thing we have to admit and, um, and, and agree to. We cannot change other people. The only thing we can do is do what we believe in. Because if you start coaching somebody, they will maybe resist it. The only thing you can do, if you strongly believe in being a different way, is to actually be that way. And there's something that ends up being contagious or not. You know, not everybody will follow you, but at least that's the only thing you can try. But going to somebody saying, you know, a lot of people come to my talks and say, ah, oh, you know, I have to tell my mother-in-law about you because she really needs your talk. That type of thing doesn't really happen. The mother-in-law will not make progress because she's not, it's not her motivation. We do care for others. We would like them to be more positive. Uh, I know, but you know, we ha you also have to understand something is that I have a aunt like that. She adores terrible news, but adores to a point that, you know, it's, it's insane. We have to respect that too. Some people feed on atrocities, you know, and it actually does, it gives more, it gives more um, energy to their lives. So I will never change her. The only thing I can do if I'm around her is just be the way, you know, I think that uh, I want to be or that I think life can be. And sometimes miracles happen. People get better. And then that's another thing. Sometimes people need help. It depends. Uh, sometimes people need psychological help. And then we're not talking about positive psychology, but this is a mental health conference today. And mental health is a whole different story. Sometimes we actually need help, and we have to be able to get it. OK, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>